Welcome to the Clarity Advisor Show, where you'll learn how to grow your team today. Join Ken Trubke and his guests as they discuss what works and doesn't work to grow your team in today's world. And now, your host, Ken Trubke. Hello, and welcome to the Clarity Advisor Show. Creating a great business culture is a very popular topic and something we talk a lot about on this show. And strategic planning has been a management staple for decades. But execution, actually accomplishing your business goals and serving your customers, is also a critical piece of business success. Today, Coach James Mayhew, America's Chief Culture Officer, returns to the show. And as his title implies, James coaches and trains companies to understand the value of culture and how to build and strengthen it to get better results. And more recently, he's been working with his clients to help them implement a system to execute better, helping them to communicate expectations, priorities, and outcomes so everybody is aligned and engaged. So from the great state of Iowa, welcome again, James Mayhew. Coach, welcome to the show. Hello, Ken, and hey, thanks for having me back. It's I just love the conversations that you and I have. I think we have some really cool synergies. We, we have some uh, you know consistent methods that we like to do, and you put together an awesome podcast, and so it's just a real honor to be here again with you. Well, I'm glad you're here. Thank you for the kind words. So let's jump right in. You're America's chief culture officer. So what changed? What did you start seeing with your clients that's led you to start focusing more on execution? It's such a great question, and I'm, I'm, I think the biggest thing that I would see, Ken, is, is we would come into a company to do some sort of form of, of individual coaching, group coaching, a training, something like that. And when I would come back a few months later, the first question, and, and even in between there, I might ask, hey, how are things going? Is this happening? Are you doing this? And I think as consultants, we all kind of know, it's like, well, we didn't really get to that. Um, something came up. And then I would come back because they'd invite me back for the next level of training. Uh, maybe James, we, we'd like to have you do some accountability work with you. We're, we're struggling a little bit with accountability. I'd come back, deliver a training. They'd give me great feedback. Hey, this was fantastic. This was exactly what we needed. And then a few months later, it was sort of the same story. It's like not a lot got implemented. And while we were doing effective training and the people that had hired me and invited me to come in and work with a company were very happy with what we were doing, I'm seeing that there's not a lot of sticky, you know, stickiness to it. There's not a lot of change that's actually happening. And so I started to do some research on this and I started to actually get connected with, with some colleagues on LinkedIn also. And here's what I found out is that execution is not intuitive. And I'll just give you a few stats. Um, I've, I've got them right up here on the side here. I don't have these committed to memory, but there was a Fortune article that said that it's less than 10% of strategies that are effectively formulated are actually effectively executed. Another one from Harvard Business Review says 64%, two out of three business leaders lack confidence in their company's ability to close the gap between strategy and execution. And then another one from HBR says that only 8% that's a very low number. Only 8% of leaders are um, you know, assessed at being very effective at both strategy and execution. And I would see a lot of times is that companies were, you know, we, we know we spend a lot of time on strategy planning, but we don't necessarily know how to, to, to ensure that it's going to happen. And they would see culture because they, they know culture is so huge and so important thinking that culture was actually the fix. And so we'd have more meetings and, and have more of these, um, you know, uh, communications that are coming from the top down. And here's the thing, we, we would start telling more and not necessarily listening well. And so again, this gap between these visits, this was really the, the glaring thing that I was noticing. So I was like, there's a better way. There has to be a better way to ensure this is happening. Yeah, I think there's an assumption that if we have the strategy that it'll get communicated down and we'll execute because we're good, high performing people with high performing teams. And so we just got to let people know what to do and they'll go off and do it. But we know from practice that that's not how it works. So what are some of the, what's the, the gap in that communication or in those assumptions? What's the fallacy in those assumptions that's not connecting strategy to execution? 
Yeah, I, well, you nailed it. I mean, it, it's a fundamental belief that we know how to execute. And so, again, we put all this effort into the strategy plan, the one-year plan, the three-year plan, the five-year plan. But what it fails to do at its at its core is that it doesn't lay out the the milestones uh, hard and fast, you know, the smart goals uh, for our company of how we're going to get there. And even if that happens, there's still a gap because what's happening from senior leadership down to the management tiers now is there's a dilution of that message, a dilution of, hey, this is our strategy. And when it finally reaches the employee, while the top may have the, this belief that in, employees know exactly what we should be working on, uh, because of that dilution, most of the time they're responding to the day-to-day -day things. They're continuing to basically do what we're doing. And so uh, that is, if you reverse it, the ideal situation is, is that at every team member level, I know I'm contributing to my own personal goals or contributing to the team or department goals that I have. And those are directly connected to our company initiatives, the strategic initiatives for that year. So that's the ideal. It's just that we never make the time to actually cause that to happen. So you're working with companies with more uh, with a more formal framework to implement and, and have execution occur. So what does that framework look like? Well, I think at the at its root, uh, you're just you're getting down to what I would call we create a performance agreement between every person in the company and the manager. I'm doing that with the senior leadership. So whether that's the, the founder the CEO or the C-suite team, that's where I'm coming in and I'm, I'm creating a performance agreement with each of them. So, and that really consists of three things. It consists of what we would call, you know, your primary outcomes that you're responsible for. Clearly we create some goals in there. And then we also have a, a cadence for a consistent one-to-one uh, -one meetings or small group meetings to happen on a monthly basis. But when you think about what everybody wants is high levels of employee engagement. And from a culture perspective, a lot of times what we're doing is we are trying to make a great place to work. We're trying to come up with this, um, you know, this family atmosphere or this relaxed atmosphere that we might say. You see that in job descriptions quite a bit on online. But what they're missing is what to, to have engagement, we need to have three things. We need to ensure that people have three things. And the first one is this. They have to have clarity about what's expected of them, both in their role and their role on a specific project, you know, absolute clarity about expectations. The second thing they need to know is clarity about the priorities. And we know that priorities change or there are competing priorities. So this is not a one and done kind of conversation. It's an ongoing thing. So we have to have clarity about the expectations and the priorities. And then I need to have clarity about how I'm doing. And that can't be a once a year, you know, thing where, where it's a once a year evaluation. We need to have feedback like, James, you're doing really great here. Like, keep that up. Or how did you come up with that idea? This is so good. Or the constructive stuff, which is, James, we need to see some improvement here. You're, you're lagging behind in this metric. You're lagging behind on, on this you know, particular skill or goal or whatever it is. Um, sometimes it's even corrective. Like, hey, we, how do we prevent that from ever happening again? But if I have those three things, I'm going to be an engaged employee. So that's real fundamental to this piece. Okay. Now, when... We hear the word execution. I think a lot of us hear something like the book Traction or the EOS Entrepreneurial Operating System. How does what you teach either align with or differ from those kinds of execution frameworks? They're, it's not all that different. It's just more comprehensive, actually. Um, so if I if I ever have an opportunity and I'm proposing, you know, my solution for a company, and I've sat with them, I've listened to what they're doing, and this isn't necessarily for you know corrective stuff. This isn't a for a company at the company level a performance improvement plan. They might be doing some amazing things, and if they say, "Hey, we're we're already using EOS or something like that," I say, "Cool. Then you understand something already, and you're so far ahead of the game." But let me show you. We're going to close every little gap that that might leave. And in particular, with EOS, is it doesn't get nearly as granular as what I'm going to do because it doesn't it doesn't stop or it stops at a certain level. We're going to take it down to every person, and so. It's really exciting for me to know that when they have something like that in place, that they're already thinking that way. They already have the mindset for it. And if it's been working, well, we're just going to pour gas on it and, and really get it going better. Okay. So what specifically makes your framework unique 
from some of these other business operating systems? This is a, I love this question. And it's because this, I kind of stumbled into this from the back end way, you know, and the, again, this was from some, some colleagues of mine. So I, uh, I, I was learning about or watching what people were posting um, on LinkedIn about execution and I'm posting about culture and we're literally saying the same thing. So what makes this unique is I started to investigate this system is culture is fully integrated into it. And you and I have had offline conversations about how do you make core values tangible, actionable, accountable. And that was the first thing I was showing. Uh, I was showing somebody, hey, look, I've created this document. And it's a way for us to actually do what I was just describing. So we, and I can get into that more with you if you'd like. But, but what we're finding is with this system, this framework, it pulls culture into the mix. You're getting progress, um, evaluations on your progress on core values and core behaviors, but it's also connecting what the goals that you're working on, how are you doing here, which is connected again, like I said, to the team goals and the company goals. And it also pulls into a very powerful discussion around your responsibilities, what outcomes that produces. But in short, like if at, a, at its highest level, it pulls in, it aligns strategic direction, it aligns the execution management portion or, or managing our execution at a highest level and the culture. And I had never seen that before. Those were gaps that I had in my own, in my own practice, in my coaching business that I just was missing. And uh, when I saw that I could solve that, I was all in. Well, James, I know that you like to take the lessons from these things and you're such a great observer of people and companies. And I want to dive into some of the lessons that you've learned and what you're seeing companies learn by going through this. And we'll do that on the other side of the break. Stay with us on the Clarity Advisor Show. We're talking with America's culture, chief culture officer, Coach James Mayhew. We'll be right back. Is your business where you want it to be or on track to get there? Clarity Advisors helps business leaders improve communication and get your team aligned and engaged for greater success. We specialize in helping you streamline your sales and operating systems to improve efficiency and grow your profits. Call or text Ken at 616-822-2998 to have a complimentary 12-minute call to see what some Clarity could do for you. Okay, welcome back to the Clarity Advisors Show. We're talking with James Mayhew about execution and getting your strategic priorities actually implemented in your business. So James, in going through the framework that you've outlined for us, what are you seeing companies learn about their ability to execute or, or what, what's happening as they go through this process? Yeah, it's, first of all, let me tell you, when, when you sit in the room and you go through this process and you see the light bulbs going on and you see, you see people going like, we've never talked about this before. That's when I feel like, okay, we're in the sweet spot. We're in the zone. But what it is, is that, you know, execution happens not because we, we, we plan to execute. Execution actually happens because we manage to it. And that's the biggest thing. So like earlier this week, so we're recording on Friday, on Tuesday, I was with a client. We were uh, in an initial phase, we're, we're launching this or onboarding this with a new client, a company of a couple hundred people. And I was sitting with what would be the equivalent of a VP role in their world. They call this a team leader. Uh, and so they're responsible for the entire business unit. And this is a business unit that's going to generate between 10 and $15 million a year in revenue for the company. And it's one of like six that they have. And so I'm working, this guy is smart. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll just call him John, okay? I'm sitting with John and I'm sitting with one of the owners of the company. And this has, has, happens to be in a, uh, a contractor style, so, uh, or industry, contracting industry. And I'm sitting with John and I'm sitting with, uh, we'll, we'll call the other guy, uh, uh, Frank. All right, John and Frank are in there, Frank being the owner. And John and I are working with Frank to come up with the outcomes that his job is counting on. It's, we spent three hours on this. That might sound like a lot of time to some of you, but it was three hours that's 10 years in the making. In other words, John's had tremendous success of what he's doing. And at the same time, he knows that there's more. So we were, I was just asking, what are the things that you are counted on? You know, nobody else is going to do these things if you don't do them. 
And we start talking about the, the duties or the responsibilities, the tasks that are recurring. And I said, these are great, but what happens if you don't do them? And that's when John was able to say, if I don't do them, well, this happens. And then that happens. And he talked about, it was his, it was his um, metaphor for this, the ripple effect. It's like throwing a, a stone into a pond. If I don't do this, it has these negative effects. But if I do these things, it has these positive effects. And I thought that is such a great way to explain it. And, and again, what was happening was uh, John and Frank are, are relating to each other through questions that I'm facilitating and they start talking about the importance of this. And Frank being the owner says to John, he's like, I just love how you pay attention to this and how you manage this and you're leading. This is amazing. And John is saying, well, thank you, but I know that I can take this further. And so, so again, it's this, con this, this concept of conversations create clarity and from clarity that produces action and then the action drives the results. And that's the, that's the amazing thing. And it's, it's creating this ownership mindset around safety, around the development of culture on my team, around how I'm developing leaders, uh, the financial ownership that I have, you know, for overseeing this business unit. It's absolutely amazing to see the growth that just happens like in a three hour meeting like that. And that's, that's literally the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. So companies are having conversations that it sounds like they've never had before. And it's really producing some rich fruit as to what should be happening and why it's important. And it's connecting people and getting people aligned. It sounds like in just the example you gave where the, the leader and the owner really connected on what's important and why. So, so yeah. James, what are, what are you learning in doing this and what adjustments have you made having gone through this process now a few times with, with clients, what, what, what's come to the front for you about how to really engage with clients to get the results that, that you're trying to deliver for them? Well, it's a very humbling experience, actually, Ken. And it's because I, I can't help but think the first thing that comes to mind when you ask that question is, is I wish I would have known this stuff years ago. Uh, these were the things that when I was in leadership and management roles that, again, it was, it was assumed that I knew how to do that. But the reality was, I'm not a strong executor. If you look at, you know, you, you do StrengthsFinder and some of these other profiles. Well, execution is my weakest domain on StrengthsFinder. I'm, I'm more visionary, strategic. And um, so I didn't know what I didn't know. But so what I'm learning through this is that uh, it, it's shifting how we think about accountability and the ownership spectrum for me personally. And, and what, it, what it causes me to do is actually become a better coach and a better consultant because I have to do the exact things with my clients that I'm asking them to do, which is to, to lean into those hard conversations, which is how is it going, right? And if somebody says, well, it's going well, and I ask a question and they say, well, there's some struggles here and, and, and you know, I've had some you know, time and priority you know, conflicts, we start to ask like the questions of why. And for me, the biggest growth in that is, I think in my own development is, is just knowing how I missed some of these things and how it would have been a game changer had, had I known how to do them better back then. Um, and, and again, it's just a humbling thing to learn. <laughs> yeah. It, it's uh, working with people. We tend to discover that and now learn and know what we didn't know. And so it, it, it is very humbling. I, I, I'm with you on that. And so normally when you and I get together and talk about things, we're talking about core values. And the last time you were on the show, we talked about core values and culture. Are you still working with clients on developing and, and enhancing their core values and culture? Yeah, thanks for asking that. And, and I will always be the culture guy and, you know, in my own mindset there. And, and it's because... Um, I believe that everything starts. I, I think believe culture is it both an input and an output is how I've been expressing it to people. So it guides things, but it's also the result of doing some of these things that we're talking about well. So it, it plays both sides. But to, to specifically answer your question around core values, I do a lot of work around that. And I believe that core values are probably the most visible or the most powerful aspect of building a really high-end culture in a company. They, they cause you to think about how do we want to get things done here? Who are the people, like what are the traits that they bring and how it impacts how we communicate, how we make decisions, um, uh, strategic decisions even. Should we do a, a, an acquisition or should we, 
Should we sell off a piece? Those are all questions that I always want my customers, my clients to filter those decisions through. At a, at a low level uh, or lower level, I'll say more at a micro level, maybe is the better way to say it is, this ensures that we're hiring really great people. And uh, we can use that in the hiring process. We can use it in the development and the assessment prog- or, um, portion of a progress meeting with people. So on that note, with this system, every month, if we have a core value listed and it's broken into a core behavior, which is how I do this, uh, and Ken, you were my manager, you would be assessing me on my ability, am I hitting our core behavior? And the only criteria that we cause from that or use from that to measure it is you either met it or you missed it. There's no you know, A, B, C, or D scale, there's no rating on a five or, or one scale with, you know, options of twos, threes, and fours. It's a miss or a met. And the reason I love the simplicity of that is that it causes the right questions to be asked. And, and if I know if it's kind of a pass or a fail, say over the last 30 days, then what this does is, is it invites the right conversations to happen. And And when we break down those values into those behaviors, we can get into the tangible aspect of it. And that's the piece that I absolutely still love probably the most. Yeah, so I've got to ask, with all the attention that it seems like core values get in in the business press, you know, blogs and podcasts and uh, videos, why do companies still not have their core values defined? Or if they do, why are they still not leaning into and living them? I think that I think the answer to the why is hard. Okay, I, you know, I, and it, and it's varied. Um, but you are one hundred percent right that you see a lot of times companies will come up with core values, and they they look great. People rally behind them. They're ex, you know, there's probably excitement around it. I, I will I will acknowledge this that there's a certain percentage of people that probably give the eye roll too around it because they probably perceive it as some sort of program of the month or hey here's the next thing that's going to make us better and. I'm not worried about those folks, right? I'm worried about the people that that are behind it. And then what's when it comes time to put um, where the let's say it this way in the old cliche of where the rubber meets the road, when we put them into action, I think there is a tremendous gap. And so I'll tell a quick story here. I had a client reach out to me a couple of years ago. Runs a small business, has this gold standard mindset, and she has four core values for her company. Uh, they're, they're sort of cliche, but to her, they were undeniably important to her. Communication, passion, accountability, and integrity. The one that she originally reached out to me on was around integrity. And she says, I've written this, I, I've defined it in these two sentences, but I just don't feel like my staff really grabs this. And I said, okay, well, I can work with this. Tell me a little bit more. And she started to say, well, we're not doing this and, and we're missing this and I just don't see the follow through. I don't see, I don't see the ownership that we want from this. I said, okay. What we ended up doing was working together with her company. And now this is, this is kind of even outside of the framework that I've been talking about. So this is the entry point that we had, which was how do you define, we got our whole staff together, small company. So it's like 15 people in the room. So, you know, this works with small companies and larger companies. We, we sat around in a room and we said, okay, what, if you were teaching me on my first week here what it looks like to operate with integrity, what would you teach me? What would you show me to do? And what would you show me? Hey, don't do this because that's that's not what we're all about here. And we started to get into these what I would call core behaviors of integrity. A really great example was that was brought up in the room and it's it's happened numerous times. It comes down to you do what you say. You do what you say. And Ken, if you asked me to assess my performance on that over the past 30 days, that seems like kind of a low bar. You do what you say. And I think I hit it most of the time. I'll bet you think you probably hit it most of the time. But the reality is there have been times when I've promised somebody to get a call back by four o'clock today and I've missed. There's been times when when I maybe um, missed getting a response to a LinkedIn message and three days go by. And I would tell people, hey, I'm responsive. You can count on me. And and so what I'm saying with a a core behavior like that is they become incredibly real in those moments to say, if if you miss this, 
two out of uh, 10 times or, or eight times out of 100. It's those eight times that something significant could happen. And so, you know, I don't, I'm not going to try and tell you that the, the one-to-one, the 100% on the safety ratio is possible. But if I'm thinking like that, and then you're asking me or you're giving me feedback how I've done over the past 30 days on that, that's the huge piece right there. And I think that companies know that they need to do that, but they don't necessarily know how or how to make it real. And that's the solution that I'm giving them. Okay. So, so stepping back, we've got culture, we've got strategy, and we've got execution. How do you rank yep. those and how do those fit together? Well, I, I, I would um, I would rank them equally, um, <laughs> which is which is hard for me to say because I've always said no, it's culture. You always have to be culture. But I really now it, it have as my own evolution through this, I would tell you that there might even be other words that we could throw up in there. Might you know like uh, throw into that like vision or communication or something like that. But as those three words go, I think of it more like a three legged stool. Remove one of those and your stool falls over. It's not going to balance there. Execution without culture can be command and control and very just harsh and not much fun to do. Or it lacks things like empathy and ideation and bringing solutions to challenges. If I'm just told, just do your job and don't think anymore, that's, a, you know, that's not necessarily what it is. And that's an element of culture. Same thing is going to be true if we have really great culture and we have a great strategy, but we don't know how to execute, we're going to underperform all day. People are going to say, what a great place it is to work, but we're not hitting our goals. And if we had investors or other people that really you know, are counting on us, such as you know, people that we take loans from at a bank or whatever, it's going to be difficult to repay some of those things. So I think all three of those are essential and the ability to like cause them to be interdependent in the way that, that, I, that we're doing with this system, I think it's just, um, it, it's a game changer. Yeah, James, I always appreciate conversations with you and especially having you on the show. You also have a podcast. Tell me about that. I do. I have another podcast. Uh, so it's called Confidence Covered by Humility. And um, I wanted to change the format. I had one previously to that kind of was called Lead Through Values. And, and I, I still love that. And it's still, you know, you can still find episodes of that online. Confidence covered by humility, though, is what my mindset is, or it's what I actually call my coaching program. So when I'm working with leaders, I want to develop people that have this strong confidence, this, this confidence that's covered by humility. Um, and we know what happens if we don't have confidence that's covered by humility. We, we can get arrogant and prideful, and we don't ask for help, or we don't take ideas, or, you know, hey, I got this. And at the same time, if I'm a leader who lacks humility, uh, I'm sorry, lacks confidence, but I have a lot of humility, people might say, hey, James is a nice guy, but they, don't, they aren't ready to run into battle together. They don't necessarily believe that they don't have confidence in me because I don't show and portray confidence enough to know that, hey, we can get through this. So it's a really interesting dynamic, and, and that's what it's built from. And um, right now, uh, uh, I'm in interview mode, and, and we've got some amazing interviews in the can. Um, I can't wait for, for those to come out. So we just launched, um, I just recorded one with uh, um, uh, Sean Van Slyke, who is a CEO for a small power company in Missouri. Uh, amazing guy. And uh, I've got some coming up that are just truly, truly great interviews. And we're just talking about how is confidence and humility working in your life? How does it impact you as a leader? Um, there's a faith-based component to this that often comes up, and I talk about that a lot. I'm fairly open with that. So it's just it's a platform that that has some variances to it, and sometimes I'm just talking about a lesson uh, or something that I've learned from a client, and I'm sharing that. So it's yeah, thanks for asking. It's a lot of fun, and uh, the interviews have really been powerful. Oh, that's great, and I, I've listened to uh, I think all of them now. Uh, we'll get a link in the show notes to those, so so people can check that out as well. So James. Who should be reaching out to you and what would be the best way for them to do that? Yeah, well, I think um, the best way to reach out to me is probably on LinkedIn or, you know, as, as our, our sales mentor would tell us, hey, give me a call, old school way, like dial it up. And so I'll share that number right now. It's 319-929-2604. And that rings my mobile phone directly. 
And um, that's, that's the number one way. Send a text if you prefer that. LinkedIn is a great place to connect with me also. I'm very active on LinkedIn. I love to comment, love to repost things that other great you know, smart minds are sharing out there. I love to repost and, uh, and then I've got original content that goes on there. Uh, and I do have a free a free resource too that I, I do want to at least mention up there. And it's something that we've put a ton of effort into over the past, oh gosh, like two and a half, three months. So it's pretty much brand new, but it's called the Thriving Culture Guide. And you can go to thrivingcultureguide.com. Just how it sounds, thrivingcultureguide.com. And that is the other piece of the question you asked, which is who who do I work with? Well, this is really geared toward founders, C-level executives, anyone in leadership, uh, as well as HR professionals too. And here's the thing is, is while this is called a, you know, a five-day boot camp for founders, that's kind of how we branded it, there is a ton of content in there also for um, anyone in these other uh, uh, positions or these other roles with the company. There will be things in there that, that are takeaways. And it's some of the best work that I've got over these last few years. So, so that would be... Um, yeah, that would be something to, to I'd encourage you to take a look. Oh, that's fantastic. And we'll get a link to that in the show notes as well. So people can take advantage of that. I appreciate you offering that and pulling that together. Well, James, it's always great talking with you. I love how you synthesize the things that you're seeing and learning and teaching and are able to translate that into something that's so practical and actionable for people. So thanks so much for being here. Thank you much, Ken. I appreciate the opportunity and we'll see you all another time. Well, with that brings us to the end of another Clarity Advisor show. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Clarity Advisor show. Clarity Advisors is a speaking, training, and consulting firm specializing in helping you simplify your sales and operating systems to improve efficiency and grow your profits. Connect with Clarity Advisors today to learn more about how they can help you improve communication and get your team aligned and engaged for greater success.